In this pilot version three tutorial, we're going to cover quasi-static simulations without a fault. This example is in the directory examples box dash 2D. We're going to consider axial and shear deformation of this 2D box that is 12 kilometers in the X direction and 16 kilometers in the Y direction. We have four boundaries. We label the boundaries uh, on the positive X side as X pause, positive Y boundary, Y pause, uh, X negative boundary, X negative, and uh, the negative Y boundary, boundary Y negative. Uh, and we're going to solve uh, both static and quasi-static uh, shear and axial deformation in this box with uniform uh, material properties. There are five steps in the example that is provided uh, with pilots. We're going to cover the first three. In step one, we're going to cover axial extension with Dirichlet displacement boundary conditions. In step two, we'll switch to shear deformation with Dirichlet boundary conditions. In step three, we'll consider shear deformation uh, with Dirichlet and Neumann traction boundary conditions. The concepts covered uh, in this tutorial are the necessary ingredients for a pilot simulation. We'll examine the uh, pilot mesh ASCII format. Uh, we'll look at parameter files, uh, the .cfg files. We'll look at three different kinds of spatial database, the zero DB, uniform DB, and the simple DB. We'll consider both Dirichlet displacement boundary conditions and Neumann traction boundary conditions. We'll go over how to run a simulation and visualize the results using Paraview. As discussed in the overview of Pilot version three, for running a Pilot simulation, we need a mesh. In this case, we're gonna get it just from a, a text editor file that we've created manually. We have our parameter files. Uh, coming in the form of .cfg files and spatial database files uh, in some cases. Those are what we need to run pilots. When we run pilots, we'll be generating HDF5 files uh, and corresponding XDMF files that will then visualize uh, both, um, you know, will visualize with pair view. So here's the geometry of our domain, as I showed earlier. Uh, and this is our mesh. And so, uh, I manually created this mesh. We have quadrilateral cells. We have 12. Uh, our discretization size is four kilometers in each direction. So for this is cell zero. It has vertices zero, five, six, and one. Cell one has vertices five, 10, 11, six, uh, and so forth. And so you can see it's very simple uh, for a very small toy example like this to just create the mesh by hand uh, and you can generally do that faster than you can um, if you um, try and use a mesh generation program. Obviously, once you get to larger meshes, more complicated geometry, it's much faster and easier, and you'll get a better quality mesh using mesh generation tools. Let's take a look at this mesh file. So here's the file. Uh, here's the file. It's, it's quad.mesh. Uh, you'll see uh, I've created a little diagram showing the layout uh, to help guide us. Uh, the ASCII file format, uh, you start uh, with sort of a mesh, open brace says it's dimension two. We'll do our index, zero based indexing. So we set uh, zero index, use index zero equal to true. We then give the vertices uh, of the mesh. We're in dimension two, we have 20 vertices. Uh, so here's uh, just, the vertex label, X coordinate, Y coordinate. Then we give it the cells. There's 12 cells. Each cell has four corners, four vertices. Uh, and then here's cell zero. Let's line things up a little better. Uh, and you'll so, so here's the label of the cell. And then these are the four vertices that are in that cell. We give the material ID for each of those cells. So in all, in all cases, we're giving, in this case, it's gonna be uh, a material ID of zero. Uh, we have then groups for each boundary. The type of group is vertices. That is, we're giving the vertices in the group. We give a name, how many, and then the indices. Uh, so our X negative boundary over here, we have zero, one, two, three, and four. So that's, um, 
what our file looks like. We have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Y negative, we have 0, 5, 10, 15. X positive, we have 15 through 19. Y positive, we have 4, 9, uh, 14, and 19. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, we have the open braces. We use indentation to just um, make it easier to read, but that indentation uh, is not required. Uh, so very simple to provide a mesh uh, for, a very, for a small example in this format. The files that are used in the simulation, they're all available in the examples box-2D directory. We have a readme that gives a brief description of the various examples and how to run them. We have a set of parameter files. We have our final mesh that we generated using the text editor, as I just showed. We have some spatial database files. We have a viz directory that contains uh, a pair of, pair of view Python script and other files for visualizing the results. And then our output will be written to an output directory. That output doesn't directory doesn't exist uh, when you first open things up, but it's created automatically when you run the simulations. So let's look at our first example. This is step one. Uh, we're going to just do a simple axial extension. So on the positive x face, we have a positive x displacement. On the negative x face, we have a negative x displacement. And we're going to put roller boundary conditions on the bottom so we have no motion uh, perpendicular to the boundary. So we expect uh, to just have uh, symmetric axial extension in this case. Here's the equations we're solving. Our solution field just has one uh, field. It's the displacement. We have our divergence of the stress is equal to zero. We, uh, on the negative uh, x to boundary, we have a minus u zero for our x displacement. On the positive x boundary, we have plus u zero. And we have uh, ui equals zero on the bottom. That's our roller boundary condition. So uh, specifying this in terms of how it translates into the simulation parameters. Uh, when we have uh, our solution field, that means we're going to be using uh, the solution field for just displacement. And it has uh, this name here. Uh, and you can see this in the, in the Pileth um, manual. And these, in fact, are the defaults, so they don't have to be specified, and they're actually not included in this, uh, specified in this example. We just use the defaults. The default basis order for the solution uh, displacement field is a basis order of one. That's a linear variation. For uh, this problem, we expect our solution to have uh, a linear variation in X, and so we should get the exact solution uh, with that basis order. Uh, for the uh, material, in terms of solving the elasticity equation, uh, the materials, we give it a name elastic. We say that the elastic material is pilot materials elasticity because we're solving the elasticity equation. We're going to give it a bulk rheology of the isotropic linear elasticity, um, and that will be assigned to the bulk rheology. Again, these are defaults, so they don't have to be included explicitly in the, in the pilot app.cfg file. And the pilot app.cfg file is read automatically in whatever, if it exists in any directory where you run pilots. So we put all of our parameters that are common to all the simulations in a directory in that file. And that uh, pre, uh, allows us to not duplicate that information in all of the subsequent uh, files. And we'll look at this in a little more detail when we look at those files. In terms of displacement boundary conditions, we have three uh, boundary conditions. They're all Dirichlet boundary conditions. So we create an array of three boundary conditions. We give each boundary condition a name. Generally, we match the name with the uh, name of the boundary that we gave it in the mesh generator. Uh, so we have a minus uh, an x negative, x positive, and y negative. They're all Dirichlet time-dependent boundary conditions. And uh, just a portion of the boundary condition information for the x positive, we're constraining the x degree of freedom. That's degree of freedom zero. And then this label here um, has to match up with the name of the group that we had in the uh, mesh ASCII file. 
Input files for step one are the mesh itself. That's quad.mesh, the Pyoth app.cfg file that will be read automatically. And then step zero one dot, uh, sorry, underscore axial disk.cfg. Um, so let's look at those files. So let's start with the pilot app.cfg file. Um, at the top, the first thing we do is we define metadata. Then we uh, give it uh, in that metadata, we, metadata, we give it uh, some keywords that we can help us search. We give a list of features that we're using. Some of these are just names of the components. Others um, can be phrases. You can do whatever combination you want. Um, but by using the names of the components, that makes it easier to find them because we those are a, a, a finite list of components rather than um, just plain text. We give it a list of journals. This is the information that's written to the screen uh, when we run PyLess. So we're going to show the problem information. That's a time-dependent problem, information about the solution, information about the mesh when we read it in, um, and whatever Petsy options are being used. Uh, here's where we specify the mesh generator, the file name of the mesh, and we give it uh, information about the coordinate system. Uh, we're going to use the default coordinate system, which is a Cartesian grid. So all we have to do is specify the space, spatial dimension. In this case, we're in 2D, so we give it a 2. Uh, next block of information is about the problem itself. We say we're going to use the nonlinear solver, not just a linear solver. Um, even though this is a linear problem, by using the nonlinear solver, we verify that we don't do any extra iterations um, beyond a single iteration and uh, verify uh, that the residual and Jacobian are consistent. We give it the problem defaults of a quadrature order of one that's consistent with our basis order of one shown down here. Um, and then we say our output, we're going to give uh, output is done in terms of a we call them observers because they observe the solution. And so our solution observers, we're just going to have one observer um, that is the domain, and we'll take all the other defaults. Uh, materials, here's our materials array, single array of a single material. We'll call that material elastic. Here's where we're specifying the information about that elastic material. We give it a description. This label value uh, must match the material ID in our mesh file. So that's why a label value of zero. We then define our material parameters. Uh, and in this case, for our isotropic linear elastic material, we're gonna have uniform density, shear wave speed, and P wave speed. So we just give those values right here in the pilot app file uh, using a uniform DB. Uh, and so this is how we define it. Our, our auxiliary field is going to be derived from a uniform database. The description is our elastic properties. The values we're going to specify are density Vs and Vp uh, with a density of 2,500 kilograms per meter cube, Vs of 3 kilometers per second, Vp of uh, 5.29 kilometers per second. Uh, these values that are required are listed in the manual. Um, and then you can use whatever units you want just make sure you're consistent. Uh, finally, uh, these our material properties are uniform. And so the internally stored values within our auxiliary field um, are density. We give it a basis order of zero, um, as well as our bulk modulus and shear modulus. So the density VS and VP are converted internally into bulk modulus and shear modulus because those are more consistent and uh, easier to use with our constitutive models. Um, so that's it for the pilot app.cfg file. It includes our problem information, some of the metadata, as well as the material properties, which are uniform and all and consistent across all of our uh, five steps of the simulation. So let's look at the step 01 axial disk.cfg file. We have comments at the top. More metadata. We show that uh, we're uh, using an additional .cfg file, pile app.cfg, just being explicit about that. That means that uh, when it collects the metadata for this file, it'll look in that file as well. We give it a description uh, for this step one, author, more keywords, um, what are the arguments to run the simulation? Uh, this is very useful if you want to automate running your simulations using the pile runner. 
it'll look at this metadata and run the simulation with the appropriate uh, arguments. It also just sort of verifies that uh, to the to anyone looking at this file when they run this example, exactly what they would need to put on the command line. We have a version number that's the version number of this example, and then for what versions of Pyloth is it compatible? Uh, and we assume that it's going to be compatible with all um, versions of Pyloth between three and up to version four. When we have a major release, we expect uh, the .cft files may need changes, and so um, if that is the case, uh, this uh, if you try and run this example using a different version of Pilot, um, you'll get an error. Uh, features for our simulation, additional features. This is a static simulation. We're actually going to use the LU preconditioner. Um, and uh, Dirichlet uh, time dependent and a zero uh, database uh, for our boundary conditions. In terms of our um, Basic parameters, we can uh, we will dump all of our parameters to the output directory. Uh, and this is what we do for pretty much all of our simulations. Uh, we give it, we use a name, and then for the parameters, we output dash parameters, progress monitor, same thing. We'll dump it to the output directory, step zero one, X field this in our progress. Uh, and then the rest of our output, we just give it, we just have to give it the um, Name of the simulation, in this case, step 01 underscore axial disk. And the default directory is output. Um, so we can just use uh, the default there. Solution, again, we'll specify that we're using a basis order one. Now we have our three boundary conditions. Uh, and so we have one on the x negative, x positive, and y negative faces, as I, we discussed when we discussed the, on the slide with the Dirichlet time dependent boundary conditions. Here's that rest of the information for the X positive. We're going to have uh, U sub X is two meters on the plus X boundary that constrains uh, the degree of freedom zero for the X displacement. So we tell which degree of freedom we're constraining. The label that corresponds to the uh, group in the mesh IO ASCII file. Here's our uniform database that I've already um, sort of mentioned to some extent. We have an auxiliary field. Uh, boundary on the X positive, initial amplitude in the X and Y directions. Even though we're constraining only the X component, we have to provide both. Um, and that's more of a Petsy constraint um, than a, a Pyloth constraint. And so here's our X displacement of two meters. Very similar for the Y boundary condition, or sorry, the X minus X boundary, constraining the X degree of freedom. You'll notice our label corresponds to the different boundary. And we've changed our initial amplitude uh, for the X displacement from plus two to minus two. Um, and then on the Y boundary, instead of using, uh, we're constraining the Y degree of freedom, again, updated label. And instead of a uniform database, we're gonna use the specialized zero database where we don't have to give values because the defaults are zero. So that's all the information we need to do to specify uh, our uh, problem set up. And so uh, let's run this example. And so there's our instructions highlighting how to run it. We will bring up our terminal window. I'm in the examples box 2D. I'm using the pilot binary. And so I type step pilot step 01. And when I run that, we'll see the information being printed to the screen. It runs relatively quickly. So I'll scroll back up and we'll walk through the information that we received. Uh, this is saying uh, where exactly it is in the file when it, uh, when it hits the print statement. This is the name of the journal that's printing. So we turned on mesh IO ASCII uh, info. And so uh, it's saying that's the name of the journal. And it said it's reading the final element mesh. Uh, once it's read it in, uh, the component will also spit out the bounding box. So this is computed from the mesh itself. So this helps you check to make sure you're looking at the, the right portion and that you uh, have set things up uh, correctly. So we go X uh, coordinate from minus 6,000 to 6,000, Y coordinate from minus 16,000 to zero. 
Uh, now we're in, in the time dependent general information. So it's going to perform a minimal initialization before verifying the configuration. Uh, then we ask for the, the solution journal as well. So it says it's doing its minimal initialization of the solution. Now we're back to the problem level, um, the time dependent problem. It's verifying compatibility of the problem configuration. And in doing so, it outputs the scales for non dimensionalization. So the length scale will be one kilometer, the time scale is uh, 100 years. Pressure scale is on the order of three times 10 to the 10th uh, Pascals. Our density scale is extremely large. This is a result of using a quasi-static simulation. Um, and uh, elasticity doesn't, equate, doesn't use temperature, but we're going to use non-dimensionalize uh, if necessary by a, uh, the one, one degree Kelvin. Um, that's generally ignored in our elasticity simulations. We're now um, going to look at uh, what happens next. We have the Petsy Options Journal displaying its information, and it shows a list of, uh, let's go down here to, uh, these are all the Petsy Options that are selected automatically. The preconditioner type is based on uh, the governing equations that we use. So it is selected that, and the fact that we're running in serial without a fault. So it selected the LU preconditioner, um, our linear solver, that's the KSP, absolute tolerance of 10 to the minus 12. Converged region means uh, it'll show the converged region, trigger an error if it doesn't converge. Uh, the nonlinear solver, the SNES solver, similar parameters, we have an absolute tolerance that we make the default is three orders of magnitude greater than the linear solver. Um, again, show why it converged. Trigger an error if it doesn't converge. The relative tolerance is on the same order as the linear solver. Um, then we have our time stepping monitor that says if the time step fails, then trigger an error. Let's monitor the time step. Uh, and our uh, default time stepping algorithm will be a uh, backward Euler. Um, Going through, it's going to time dependent problem it says it's solving the problem. Here's our time stepping monitor information. This is time step zero. Our initial time step is 0 0.01. That's in non dimensional units. Uh, and we're starting with a time of zero. The, uh, we see what the initial residual value is for the nonlinear solver. So we start out with a residual of 10 to minus two. Our linear solve converged due to relative to the absolute tolerance being met in one iteration. That's what we would expect with the LU preconditioner. Uh, we get now a nonlinear uh, solver residual of 10 to the minus 18, which is essentially zero, well below our absolute tolerance of 10 to the minus nine. Uh, and it says it's converged uh, due to the absolute tolerance. Uh, the time step after doing a single time step uh, is up to 0 0.01. Uh, we only ask for one uh, time step, so it ends there and it says that it's finalized the problem. Now, if we look in the output directory, you can see we have a lot of files. You'll see that for every HDF5 file, there's an XMF file, that's the XDMF file. The H5 files are binary files, but we can display that information using the H5 dump utility. So let's uh, we can, instead of printing the entire file, I'm just going to print uh, what it, its hierarchy looks like. Let's look at the solution over the domain HDF5 file. And I forgot to add in that this is an output directory. And you'll see that at HDF5 file contains information about the geometry. That's the coordinates of the vertices, timestamps, the topology information is given in cells. And then there's vertex fields, which is the displacement um, over the, the vertices as the solution. So that's a basis order of one. If it was a basis order of two, these would be cell fields because they'd be given as values within the cell. Uh, let's look at our progress monitor. What This will not be very uh, exciting. Oops, again, I forgot to put what this is 
in the output directory. So it shows the timestamp of, of the first time that it gave us our progress. So that was uh, today at uh, 1331 and eight seconds. It was at a simulation time of one year, percent completed zero, estimated completion to be determined. Um, if we had multiple time steps, we'd see an update uh, with the percent complete, uh, as well as an estimated time of when the simulation would, when it would be expected to finish based on just a linear extrapolation um, from the current time. The, prog the um, parameter file here, this is a JSON file. Um, so it shows all the information. This is not particularly easy to see and to read. And so we can load this up in the parameter viewer. Um, uh, we'll show that uh, a little bit later. Uh, and then let's visualize the results of this. So we're going to start up Paraview. And I already have Paraview running. So this is what we get when we initially start up Paraview. I'm going to use the Python script to uh, view the information. And so I am going to go to Tools. Uh, Uh, views, I want to view the Python shell. So now here is showing up our Python shell. Um, and uh, it'll take a second to start up the Python shell. There you can see. And I'm going to run a script. And so I just can use in the defaults. And so I can go straight to viz plot displacement warp. And so there you can see. Uh, let me let's turn off the deformed configuration. So this is our original configuration, uh, and then when I exaggerate the deformation by a factor of a thousand, you see that when we pulled, we have axial extension. We have uh, of two meters on each end, um, and with roller boundary conditions on the bottom, due to the Poisson effect, uh, we have uh, a negative y displacement at the top of the box. Um, we can turn on. Additional information. So in the work, I can turn on some glyphs and show um, the. Uh, let's change the color of those to be instead of coloring the displacements, we'll color on white. So this is showing uh, the uh, direction of the displacement. You'll notice that. Uh, we have a little bit of X displacement, mostly Y displacement. And then as we get near the bottom, we have just X displacement because of our roller boundary conditions. It's not showing all of the values. So let me find uh, it's, it's presentation. There's one of these settings where I can, where you pick whether you want them all. Or let's go back to the top here. So we can scale by displacement, scale factor, we can put in as a thousand to match. Um, and then I, oh, here's our uniform distribution. Let's do all points. Uh, apply, and now we get. Uh, we'll see if we get a, a, a vector at every single vertex, whereas before we were only getting a subset. And now our, L, our arrows are scaled by the amount of displacement and aren't just giving us orientation. So if we want to delete that, we can just click the delete button here and we get back to our original one um, uh, with the color scale. So this is the uh, end of the first uh, step and so let's reset our turn view so we can move on to the next example. And we'll come back to pair view, come back to our terminal. Let's return to our slides. So this is what we ran. You'll see that we this is that was the output.
That was our visualization of the results. So now we're going to move on to step two. This is our simple shear using the Dirichlet displacement boundary condition. So now on the, uh, we do simple shear. So on our positive x boundary, we give it a y displacement. Minus x displacement, we give it a, a y dis minus y displacement. At the bottom, minus x displacement. And uh, everything is symmetric, so we have to have an offset because we put this uh, as a, at, at zero and this at minus 16. Um, if we look at what this looks like, uh, again, our uh, derivation of our governing equations looks quite similar. Uh, we have our displacement field. Uh, we have our elasticity equation, no changes there. Now uh, we have four boundary conditions. Uh, so we update our boundary condition array to be x negative, y negative, x positive, y positive, all Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now on our x positive boundary, we're constrained to degree of freedom one because that's the y displacement uh, and similar for the other ones. Uh, now we have more parameter files. Um, our displacements on the boundary, instead of being uniform, very linearly in space in one direction. We again use our quad mesh. We have the same exact same pilot app.cfg file. We now have a specific uh, parameter file um, for uh, the um, step zero two, and there's an error that should be underscore shear disk, not dash shear disk. Um, and our spatial now we have four da spatial databases. We use a, uh, a separate spatial database to just to specify the displacement in each of the boundaries. And so we give it a similar name um, corresponding to the boundary condition. That makes it easy to find which spatial database we're using for which uh, boundary. So let's look at our input files. So we have the same pilot app.cft file. Let's go to step zero two. And just a note, I'm using a uh, Visual Studio Code to display these files. It gives automatic syntax highlighting, which makes it much easier to view these files. You can use your other favorite text editor, um, but using one that has embedded syntax highlighting makes it much easier to follow um, and uh, visually parse uh, your parameter files. So just a little text description at the top of what the problem we're solving, similar to the diagrams that I've shown. Uh, we have our metadata. In this case, we're doing simple shear using Dirichlet boundary conditions. Uh, keyword is now simple shear. Here's our arguments, shear02 underscore shear diff.cfg. Version information. Again, we're just going to use the LU preconditioner. I'll need to update those files. Um, output, very similar to our steps one. We give the names for the parameters, names for the progress monitor, default name. Uh, for all of our other output files. Um, basis order again of one. Now we have our four uh, boundary conditions, all four Dirichlet boundary conditions. Let's look at our X negative, very similar to what we had before. We're constraining the Y degree of freedom now on the X positive X phase or minus X phase. That's degree of freedom one. Uh, the label, that's the name of the group of vertices in the uh, mesh IO ASCII file, uh, that's boundary X negative. Now we're going to use the default. We're going to use a simple database um, because we want a linear variation. So we have to, it's more complicated. We need a separate file to specify that. Again, description is the Dirichlet boundary condition on the minus X edge. Here's the name of the special database file. And we're going to say that we're going to do a linear query type. That means it's going to do linear interpolation. Uh, the alternative to linear interpolation is nearest. Um, and then we would, if uh, we'd have to specify it at sort of the discretization level to get a linear variation. The nearest query type uh, works well if you have just uh, certain uniform values in space with maybe a jump or discontinuity. Uh, if you want a linear variation, you should definitely use the um, linear query type. Uh, it's very similar for the y negative. Now we're constraining X on that face. It has a separate uh, spatial database file, similar query type. 
as well as the other two boundaries. So let's look at one of these spatial database files. Let's look at the X negative, so shear dish boundary condition X negative spatial DB. Uh, now we don't have any syntax highlighting. Um, generally, this is sort of C++ type, so we can turn on that and it'll look at the comments. That's what this first line is attempting to do automatically. It does automatic syntax highlighting in uh, Emacs, um, but not in Visual Studio Code. Um, here's a mat, uh, header information. This says it's a spatial database file. That's an ASCII file. Uh, we give the name of the spatial database object simple DB. That's required. Um, it only works for a simple DB file. Number of values is two. That, so that's the number of components we're giving. Initial underscore amplitude underscore X. Uh, this is different than what we had in Pilot version two, where we're using dashes. Um, we're also explicitly giving the components um, that this is uh, automatically set up uh, for uh, reading this information into Pilot. We give units for both of those values. The number of locations we're going to specify is two. So, and the data dimension is one. So we're going to do a linear variation with just the two endpoints. We could do a data dimension one and multiple points, like say five or six, and it'd be a piecewise linear variation. We give the space dimension of our coordinate system is two. Then we give the details in the coordinate system. We're going to specify our coordinates in kilometers. So we have to multiply by a thousand to get to meters. So it'll automatically do that conversion for us. Um, and then our columns are the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, initial X displacement in meters, and initial Y displacement in meters. Everything you see with the double slashes is a, is a comment, and those lines are ignored. Um, that's why they're shown in green in our syntax highlighting. Uh, so on the negative X space, that's our X coordinate is the same. And then we go, for, you'll see we have a linear variation in the Y dis, uh, in the X displacement and the uniform displacement in the uh, Y direction. But we're only going to be using um, one of these. Uh, I believe well, since we're on X negative, it's just going to be using the amplitude in the Y direction. Okay, so let's go back uh, to um, and run this. So that's this. That's what our material properties look like. This is what we expect the output to be. We are going to let's clear our screen. Run step zero two underscore shared disk dot cfg. And so we'll see we we'll get a very similar output than what we had before. We start with our mesh information. We have the same bounding box, same scales, our non-dimensionalization. Our Petsy options are the same. We run the same type of problem. Uh, this time we start out with a residual of 10 to the minus three. We reduce that to 10 to the minus 18, so essentially zero. We again converge due to the absolute displacement uh, and uh, we finalize the problem and no error messages. So now we'll go to uh, Paraview and visualize the results. Now we need to change which simulation it's looking at. So we can, in our Python script, uh, we will replace the default value of the sim with a uh, step 02 underscore shear disk. This means it's going to look for the other parent, other output files in the output directory. Uh, we don't have to give it any more information than that. This is documented in both the pilot manual, and there's a special section on how you run Paraview scripts and override the defaults. We can then just load up our Paraview script again. Uh, you'll notice that it read in step 02 underscore shear disk dash domain. And here is our deformation of our domain. You'll see that we have simple shear, uh, uh, positive x, positive y displacement in this corner, minus x, minus y displacement in that corner. Uh, nice linear variation, straight edges on all the boundaries. Uh, and uh, you see our undeformed configuration uh, shown by the, the gray line. So everything looks like is worked uh, fine. 
Uh, and so one thing I want to point out is how did it define what the output file names are? And this is new in Pilot version three. So if we look at our output directory, let's look at all the step two files. And so you'll see that we have bc underscore x negative, we have domain, um, and we have elastic. And so what these, the domain, the elastic, the boundary condition like y negative. So it takes the name of the simulation and then it adds the name of the component that we gave it in pilot. The underscore info, those are fields that are uh, just informational diagnostic information. So in the case of like output, uh, the elastic, I'll show using the H5 dump what that file contains. Uh, it contains the bulk modulus density and shear modulus. Um, and those are cell fields because we used a basis order of zero to discretize those. If we'd used a base sort of one, they would have been vertex fields. Um, yeah, they're not very interesting in this case because we're uniform. And so it's all the values uh, for every, all the values are the same for all the different fields. Uh, if you just run H5 dump on that file, um, you can see that there's the cells, there's the time stepping, there's the coordinates. And you'll see like the shear modulus, we have the same value for all 12 cells. For the density, we also have uh, the 2,500. And so um, you can confirm that, yes, everything is uh, being read in from the spatial databases correctly. Um, and that's why we call them underscore info files. They're diagnostic information. You can plot them up into pair view um, and uh, look at them in uh, just the same way we look at the solution. Um, so, uh, that's it for step two. We can move on uh, to step three. So let's go back uh, to our slides. There's our visualization of the results for step two. Step three now, we're gonna uh, change our uh, norm, uh, we're going to add normal boundary conditions on the plus y and minus y faces. We could have chose to do it uh, differently on the other faces. Um, this is just makes it a little more makes it a little easier because it's a symmetric uh, extension of the problem. It gets a little complicated when you want to constrain things uh, down here in the corners and keep things symmetric. So this is just a simple way um, to uh, make. Uh, a normal on boundary condition and have the same solution as what we had uh, in step two. On the positive uh, Y face, uh, we're gonna have a negative traction of two times the shear modulus times uh, this constant A. On the bottom boundary, also the same. And you'll say, well, why is this uh, traction uh, negative if it's in the plus X direction on the Y face? And so the how we define the direction of the tractions, the tractions are given in tangential uh, and normal space in turn, instead of the X and Y components. Uh, the normal direction is outward from the domain. And we take the cross product of the plus Z direction with that normal to get the uh, tangential direction. So plus C cross it with Y, that would be in the uh, minus X direction. And so, uh, that would be what a positive tangential traction is. We need to reverse that, shown in the direction of the arrow. And so that is a minus. Um, so uh, this the arrow shows the direction of given the sign that I show here. So minus two times the shear modulus times our constant A. Same thing for the Y boundary. We have uh, the normal away external from the boundary. You do the cross product of plus Z, which is coming out of the screen. Uh, and so our plus uh, tangential traction will be to the right. We need it to the left. And so that gives us our minus sign. Uh, so here's how we uh, divide up our, on the right. I show our diagram. Here's our constitutive information uh, and equations. Again, we have elasticity, no change there. 
Again, no change in our materials. Um, and so uh, now we show for our boundary, we have four boundary conditions. Uh, this time we're on the plus X and minus X spaces, we're constraining both the X and Y dis uh, displacements. And then we have a, a traction boundary condition on our plus Y and minus Y boundaries. Um, so here's our four displacement, uh, sorry, four boundary conditions. X faces, Dirichlet time dependent, Y faces, Neumann time dependent, constraining now both the X and Y degrees of freedom on uh, our S plus X uh, boundary. Uh, in this case, we have just uh, five parameter files. Uh, we have the mesh file, the pilot app dot file, our dot CFG file, again, underscore not dashed. Um, and then uh, for our spatial uh, databases, we're just using those on the X negative uh, and X positive face. And we can reuse the same ones we had before because we included both components in those files. So now let's run our simulation. So clear our screen, pilot step, pilot step, oops, step zero three. Shear distract.cfg. And so it ran very similar to our previous case, uh, which is not surprising since this step two and step three are essentially the same, only we replaced two of the Dirichlet boundary conditions with Neumann boundary conditions. Again, we end up with a residual of 10 to the minus 18. So let's visualize the results. We need to reset uh, pair view. And now we can just change our, the name of our simulation to 03 shear disk track to get all those files. Uh, run our same visualization script. And there it is, exactly the same solution as before. We can rerun our script with. Uh, Step two, and I'll remove, uh, let's not look, we don't need two timestamps. Uh, and then the warp, in this case, I'll change instead of surface with edges, I'll make it a wireframe. Uh, and we'll change it to be a solid color. Let's make it, let's see what solid color do we want. Let's make it. Uh, what's a good orange? Maybe uh, how about yellow to stand out a little better? We'll change the line width to four. And there you can see uh, our step two simulation superposed in the yellow wireframe on our, sorry, our, yes, our step two solution superimposed on our step three simulation. Uh, and you can see that we get exactly uh, the same result. And so, uh, you may be wondering how we develop these Python scripts. Um, and so the easiest way to develop these Python scripts is uh, you can go to um, the, uh, under tools in Paraview, you can do start trace. Uh, and you can't see my other screen, but I just say, okay. And then anything I do, it'll start to be recorded in a file. So I can load in some additional data. Let's load in some output. Let's load in the step zero one. Let's look at the, say the elastic information. Elastic underscore info. We load in the XMF file. Uh, we use the, the reader that is not XDMF3. Uh, if you're loading those others, you likely get pair of you will likely crash. So now here's our information. Let's turn off uh, our solution information. So here you can see that this is showing bulk modulus on the surface. You'll see it's all the same value, so it's not very interesting. You can do surface with edges, you can barely see 
uh, the cells, but uniform information there. If you click on the information tab, you scroll down. Um, it's not very visible, it's shown in green, but you'll see that all the values are uniform um, as we expect uh, and saw in the HDMF, sorry, the, the HDF5 files that everything was uniform. But you can load anything in. Uh, and then if I do tools, stop trace, uh, up will pop uh, a file that has all of the Python commands to do exactly what I did using the graphical user interface. So this is the easiest way you can cut and paste these, this information into a, a, a text editor and edit it, sort of clean it up, make it a little more uh, easier to understand. Um, and then uh, you can have um, a file similar to our plot uh, displacement warp. Uh, where you do things repetitively viewing the simulation. Um, it also allows you um, to uh, basically repeat your visualization without having to go through all the graphical user interface. Um, and it makes it much easier if you're doing repetitive visualization, uh, either of different simulations or the same simulation, uh, doing it multiple times, especially of a very complex uh, sort of visualization with um, arrows, glyphs, um, and uh, the more things you try and display simultaneously, uh, the more difficult uh, it becomes to, and time consuming it becomes to reproduce it in the graphical user interface. So let's go back to our, our slides and wrap up this tutorial. There we ran the simulation, there's a visualization of the results. Um, so that's it for this quasi static simulation. Uh, the steps uh, four and five add some time dependence uh, and or in the initial conditions. I believe step four is initial conditions. Step five is time dependence, um, which uh, we deform the boundaries uh, with time. Uh, and so you can see what happens when we put uh, velocity and traction uh, rate boundary conditions. That is uh, the tractions increase with time, the displacements increase with time. Uh, and in the user manual, those are covered uh, in the same way that we've covered these examples. It shows the output, shows the visualization. You can run the Python script uh, with the updated simulation name. Uh, and at the very end of the pilot manual for of the examples, uh, box 2D, it also gives a list of exercises that we recommend um, that you undertake if you want to sort of dig a little deeper and play around with this example.